Hello everyone, here's a brief explainer on threads on our bike, why they go certain directions, and understanding why they might work loose. Before we get into the nitty gritty, let's start with direction. A right-handed thread is your most common and left-handed, often called reverse, is used far less frequently, and where it is used is application dependent. The term right hand or left hand is named not so because you tighten it with your right hand or because the thread goes to the right and adding hand at the end made it feel all the more homely. It's because if you had a right handed screw on the counter and place your hand with your thumb pointing in the same direction as the plane that the screw is going into, then your fingers point in the direction the threads helically wrap around the axis. It's the same with a non-drive side pedal. And speaking of pedals, why do they have threads that run in different directions? What if our pedal threads were both right-handed? Well, then the non-drive side could potentially work loose. As the non-drive crank goes through its rotations, the axle is fixed, but the platform needs to allow movement. Those bearings on the axle are rolling, and even if running well lubed and in good shape, will still generate a small amount of friction. This is especially true when we add flex to the system. And it's that small amount of friction that will help tighten the pedal instead of loosening it. The theory also goes that as bearings begin to seize, the unit will begin to loosen. This isn't something that's happened to me personally, but it would make sense if there was a large amount of friction. Another noteworthy opposite thread is in the drive side of our bottom bracket shells. As the crank comes through and over, it will tighten the thread. But hang on a minute, these directions are all wrong, surely. That left hand pedal, which is constantly turning to the right, and that right hand crank, which is coming up and over the bottom bracket in a clockwise direction, are going to work their respective fixings loose, surely. Well, let's focus on our cranks here. You have to remember that the inboard of the bearing might in fact be going clockwise, but the outboard of the bearing will be doing the exact opposite. Now, let me demonstrate with this humongous bearing. As I roll it along the counter, you can see the inboard and the outboard work inversely to one another. It's the direction of the outboard that's important, as that will be the thing driving our hardware. The last prominent reverse thread found on a bike is often in rear hub assemblies. How do you know if it's in reverse thread when it's already in? Well, it's a tricky one. Be sensible and don't try and remedy it with heavy handedness. Knowledge is your friend. If you get the feeling that something just isn't coming, try and find the tech document. The best way to identify threads when the axis is visible is to look at them square. If all the threads point towards the top right, then it's right-handed. If they go to the top left, then it's left-handed. Most pedals and bottom brackets have some kind of indication, be it a line on the non-drive side or a simple L. So let's look back at our pedals and bottom brackets and be sure in our knowledge before moving on. Is everyone square? Now let's look at the size of our threads. Threads are often broken down into two terms coarse and fine. The term coarse is used where there is a greater distance between each thread, and a finer thread is the opposite, where there are more wraps of thread at any given distance. However, please make a note here that neither term is a denotation of quality, but rather a technical term. The more coarse a thread is, then the less likely it is to cross thread. It also means there can be a greater differential between the major and the minor thread diameters. Think of the major thread as the mountain's peak and the minor thread as the very bottom of the valley floor. All of this subsequently correlates into that whatever our bolt is turning into is less likely to thread and it's quicker to do up, perfect for something like fork axles. The more fine a thread is, then the better it is at minor adjustments, so perfect for aligning our gears. It also has a longer wrap of thread for the same size of bolt when compared to something more coarse. Let me show you with this string. The bolt hasn't changed, but we've been able to maximize the amount of thread wrapped around the axis by using a finer thread. A finer thread is more efficient than a coarse one at transmitting torque. This means that higher tension can be achieved at lower torques. Now I think I've been talking enough. <laughs> 
Quanta persona non grata numero uno, friction. When you're tightening something up, you will, at some point, notice an increase in torque required to turn the bolt. In an ideal world, this feeling is derived due to clamping force at the head of the bolt and not friction in the thread. This can depend on a number of factors, such as how fine or coarse that thread is and whether it is lubricated or not. The last big factor is the material. It's also worth noting that some materials have a friction coefficient far greater than others, and some screws are application dependent to achieve desirable results. I think sometimes, and it might just be me, but I'm often skeptical about five Newton meters or other torque specified ratings, because most of the time, in bicycle components at least, they don't specify what we're treating the threads with, if at all. Five Newton meter torque reading with a lubed bolt is drastically different to the same torque reading if the thread is dry. I'm sure we've all turned brake bolts where they have so much compound on them, they're hard to get in or out. Well, take that experience and apply it to the bigger picture. Is it tension at the head or friction in the bolts that we're measuring? Friction coefficients are quite a complicated matter. The lower the number is, then the less they're gripping against each other. There is a static and sliding measurement. Static can take a great feel of force to overcome, and then the force required lessens to continue to overcome the sliding friction. This, of course, is being similar to pulling a car. It can take a huge amount of effort to get it moving, but once it begins to move, it requires less effort to keep it rolling. So, do we want high static friction in our bolts? Well, it is in my opinion, we want it at the head of the bolt and not in the thread. It's for that reason that sometimes we conversely put grease onto things when we want them to stay put. It's so the friction required to achieve that static load at the head of the bolt is reduced. So how to retain our bolts? Apart from having torqued them correctly, of course. Well, you can use a washer between the bolt head and the thing that it is clamping towards. This enables the head to spread its load evenly upon the surface it is being driven against. Ever wondered what that wire does that comes in Shimano brake adapters? It's there to run through the small holes in the head of the bolt and wire them into place. This stops them unwinding over time. Thread lock appears in all kinds of places over our bikes. They could be separated into two different groups, anaerobic and aerobic. Anaerobic is the kind that comes in a liquid form. You apply it to the threads and, once assembled, it will slowly cure independent of air. In its liquid form, it can even reduce the friction on the threads to aid assembly. Aerobic, which is often referred to as dry, this comes applied straight from manufacturer and is primarily used to fill out threads. It can whittle away over time, so if you're ever installing and reinstalling a lot, don't be afraid to top it up with some anaerobic thread locker. Retaining compounds are more like a putty. They often aid in keeping things that are pressed or riveted in place. It's a pretty common when on road bottom bracket shells, the bearings are pressed straight into the frame, and if the tolerance is even slightly out, you sound like you're being chased down the road by John Bonham. Now, retaining compounds and thread lockers come in a huge variety of strengths. The weaker ones are made so you can still service the part. Be careful where you use the strong ones and even on what material. I've seen soft alloy bolts lose their whole thread before because they become chemically bonded due to either excessively strong or excessive amounts of thread locker. Sometimes though, things can just go awry. Now, cross-threading is something that is easy to do, especially with finer threads. A good way to avoid it is to turn it backwards in the opposite direction that the thread runs while you're pressing it in lightly. You'll eventually feel a small click as the units find their starting threads. Then you can dial it in from there. And what to do if you've completely removed all of the thread in there? Well, when damaged to a lesser extent, sometimes they can be just cleaned out with a tap. Often though, you won't be so lucky. Losing all the thread or damaging them beyond repair is a common problem with crank sets. I, in my experience, find that running a pedal with washers helps prevent this. If, however, 
you're already up a certain kind of creek without a certain kind of paddle, you might be reaching for something to rectify the damage, a helicoil. A helicoil is a simple device where you drill out the original hole to increase its size slightly and tap it with a thread. You then fit a coil, or in some cases insert a tube that has thread on both the outside and the inside. You then fit this coil using an external thread directly into the crank. Then apply a good dollop of thread lock to leave it to set overnight like a prize winning blancmange before reinstalling your pedals. Once that pedal is installed, here are some notes. In my experience, it's a good way to salvage a crank, but it is a repaired unit that I don't think is as strong as the original. It won't like super hard compressions, for instance. And letting that thread locker cure is absolutely vital and you must, 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 must run it with a pedal washer. The same theory applies to other helicoils and inserts. Sometimes you hear of people helicoiling stems or their fork lowers. The problem lies in that you're having to remove material, potentially weakening the part to install the helicoil, or as you increase the diameter of the original thread, it's weakening it. So just be wary as it can often be a can of worms. And so there it is, my thread explainer. Certainly a mouthful, some of that. Now, if you want to stick with the channel, click down here to see a tour of the Gore factory with Doddy, which is highly recommended, and click down here for a real-time service of an air shaft on a RockShox fork. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Cheers.